Nike, it is awesome to have you back on the show. We spoke about a year ago, and at that time, there were a lot of uh, amazing things happening in your life. And since then, you've written a book, your family has moved across the world, you've created some amazing assets that you've been sharing with everyone. And I'm so excited for you to be here today and talk about the new book that you've, you've launched. And I'm so honored that you've wanted to come back on the show. Well, thank you so much, Laurie. It's awesome to be back. Thank you for having me. And it's also been a very busy year for you. Congratulations on the award, the Communicators Award, and for going over 100 episodes on the podcast. So yeah, um, I know I know how it is to be a content creator. It takes a lot of consistency and hard work. So well done. Oh, thanks so much. Yeah, it's hard to believe you were episode 60. And now, you know, we're airing over the episodes in the hundreds. So amazing how time flies for us. And when you came on, we talked about founder succession to the next generation. It's something you're very passionate about. I really want to encourage the, the listeners to, to hear that episode if they haven't yet already, because I think it'll be a great companion episode to this one. And also, we should mention, this is our third conversation, I think, technically, right? Because mm-hmm. I was also on your show called The yes. Connected Podcast, and it's a fantastic show for family business owners and for entrepreneurs who are looking for inspiration to connect. And I want to also encourage the audience to listen to your show, not only my episode, but other ones as well. And again, the Connected Generation podcast. So let's jump into why you're here today, which is really to talk about this new book that you've written. And it's called Lifetime to Legacy. Tell me about the premise of the book. Mm. The premise of the book is that I strongly believe that it's really important that families not only focus on protecting the future of their enterprises, but actually creating the enterprise of the future. And I feel like in this space, there's a lot of talk about the technical elements, like the technical legal planning, the tax planning, the wealth planning, but really we need to also focus on the quantitative aspects of um, multi-generational family business and family wealth planning, looking at the relational elements. I believe that these are the foundations of um, business planning and wealth planning, which the technical planning sits on top of. And it really was based on my inside experience as a business owner, as well as whilst consulting families, I noticed that there were common themes and common threads that I would see. Um, um, I would often be approached by a founder, like in their 60s or 70s, that had spent a lifetime building a business that was very successful, but could see that there was a new season upon them. And it was time for them to start thinking about what's next or who's next in the business, but they literally didn't know where to start. And maybe they wanted one of their children to be next, but none of them were by their sides, literally or metaphorically, right? And this would lead to maybe the kids were had other interests or were geographically located really far away. And this created a lot of angst over what to do to preserve the many years of hard work, wealth and legacy, but they didn't know how to go about it. But they would often be, they would often have a trusted advisor, maybe an attorney um, that would suggest set up a trust, set up a trust to, you know, and name your kids as beneficiaries. And this sorts out the succession issue, but it does not, it doesn't sort out the relational issues. There's real need for the family to come together um, to gain clarity of vision, of mission, of values. What's, what, where is this all going towards? Um, What do we want as a family? What do we stand for? Um, There's real need for the family to communicate over emotional matters as well as over technical matters and there's real need for the family to collaborate and that was really the premise of the book was just to um, have provide this practical handbook for families that's there's a, a, a bit of academics stuff in there but really it's super practical and there's a lot of stories in there based on my personal experience as well as based on like I said folks that I've served naturally confidentiality remains so we protected the identities of whomever I'm talking about but um, to really get folks to have something practical with tips that they can in- implement in their families and in their businesses to build legacy. That's a, an important point that it's practical and it's really meant for these multi-generational businesses 
Let me ask a question about that. In terms of the reader, are you looking to reach, I'll call it the senior generation or the next generation? Both. Or both. <laughs> both. Um, I think honestly, I, am, I see three sets of readers, um, the senior gen, the next gen, but also advisors and non-family staff who a lot of the time don't have deep insight into the family dynamics and the family enterprise system and may find it awkward to navigate that and to navigate um, how to assist their clients. So those are the three sets, but yeah, it's not just for the next generation or the founders. There's sections on why is it difficult for founders to let go and how can we help them through that? There's sections on why is it difficult for next gens to grab on and champion change and how can we also help them through that? Um, and then there's sections of gaining understanding of family enterprise system and family dynamics. So I see it as one that has tremendous value for those three sets of readers. And it's, and it's something where it can be too late, right? In our lives, we have only so much time on this planet and 100% of business owners are going to leave their company one day. And if we don't have these conversations, there can be some fallout. Have you worked with clients and, and had maybe from your own experiences, case studies where, you know, again, inspiring your book, that if mm. we don't address these things while everyone is in the room, <laughs> proverbially speaking, or literally in the room, that there's a real downside here. Yeah, unfortunately I have. I've had a case where a founder had built up a conglomerate of different businesses in different industries and um, set up a trust. And the tr scope of the trust was the businesses as well as the family foundation and didn't have any conversations with his spouse or the kids. And so he transitioned and left four kids. Two were married with kids and his spouse. Um, and they were all the five um the four kids and the wife were supposed to be the beneficiaries of the trust and make decisions and take strategic decisions over the family assets. But only one of the kids had had experience working in one of the family businesses. And it was the, also the structure was quite complex. There was a lot of interdependency between various operating businesses. And there had never been a reporting mechanism in terms of providing financial reports to the shareholders, because it was all very informal when dad was in the room. And the siblings were all very different. They'd never worked together. They'd never come into partnership before. Mum also didn't have business expertise. Um, so taking strategic decisions together was a bit of a nightmare and they were squabbling in, in meetings. And it was threatening not only the survival of the partnership, but also their family relations. It got to the point where two of the kids were not turning up for family events, like for Christmas and things like that. So that was a real, you know, worst case scenario where it got to the point where I was trying to be pulled into the room to kind of, um, to improve things. But two of the family members were not willing to cooperate with their family members anymore. So it's really important that you know, when we take a step back as business founders, we invest, yes, in the technical, do talk to your attorneys, drop a trust and wills and all these great stuff, but you must have these conversations. You must get into a cadence of articulating the vision and the mission and the values of the family and starting to co-create. And it's important that the siblings start practicing their partnership during the lifetime of the founder, where they understand each other's personalities, perspective, priorities, preferences, and get into a cadence and a rhythm of working together because they're moving from being just siblings to being business partners. And sometimes, like I said, like in this case, only one sibling had the expertise of for one of the businesses, right? So sometimes they need time to be, to train and coach and guide them in different elements of say corporate governance or industry specific experiences or softer skills, leadership and influence, navigating family dynamics, conflict management and resolution. And these things do take time to develop. So it's really important to invest in the relational, not just the technical. Absolutely. One of the chapters uh, you called the importance of connection and emotional proximity. Can you explain a little bit more about that? Yeah, um, I'm very passionate about the importance of empathy 
particularly in family firms, because I think there's it's quite a complicated system where you have multiple stakeholders. And quite often um, in relationships, in any relationship, it's really to have a productive relationship. It's, it's important to understand um, the perspective, priorities, and preferences of the next person. And we'll only get that if we draw near emotionally and, I guess, um, start to develop deep empathy for one another. And a really good way to do that is to develop an empathy map. So, and that requires, it's, it's really, it requires a lot of listening. It requires a lot of observation. It requires a lot of non-judgment and curiosity. And in the book, I, um, I, I share more about empathy mapping. And really it's just, what is the next, what is Laurie thinking, seeing, hearing, feeling? with respect to the family and respect to the business. Um, she may be, she's lost her spouse. She may be the surviving spouse and she may feel like she's completely out of her depth, has no expertise in this. And um, this business actually is provide, giving her a lot more anxiety than financial security, right? Whereas on the other side, you might have a next generation who, you know, feels he's on path to being successor and has a completely different perspective and priority. His perspective and priority might be to grow the business, operating business, to raise cash or to get investments from institutional investors and things. So it's only when we draw near emotionally and gain um, perspective on the next person's lens through which they see things that we'll be able to understand each other and then communicate in a language that is native to the next person when we're communicating our ideas and then we're able to really collaborate and co-create. And the um, empathy map is something that connects us, you know, emotionally, ideally. Seems like this senior member really has to create that space because that person sometimes looms large in the culture. And if they don't open the door to that, let's say if there's two, three children, the next generation in the business who already are competitive with each other because they're siblings and that's what they do. Mm -hmm. They're probably also very competitive in the, in the work environment. And so when the founder passes on, as you say, they, they left, but I assume in that mm -hmm. story, they died. Um, mm -hmm. It's, it's difficult because then they're left to wrangle with some of these issues themselves and they may not have the tools to really, to really do it. That's some of the things that I've seen is, and if the founder doesn't really create that environment for them, I call them the founder, mm. but let's say the more senior generation, mm. then um, there's link, there can be lingering issues that are very difficult to solve because also, you know, folks are maybe in their forties, fifties, and they're set in their ways. It's hard to change. Mm. Mm. Have you seen that where people have been able to change using some of the tools and techniques? I think, you know, I often deal with the next generation um, and I work with them privately one-on-one -on -one, and I educate them on the systems at play. So self, family, business, and you can control yourself. And it's really by gaining mastery and learning more about your emotional makeup and awareness of, you know, historical events that have impacted the perspective through which you see things, your personality type and things like that. So you you can only have complete control over self, <laughs> right? And so I educate them on, okay, you can improve upon yourself and that can impact on the system because it is a system, but you can't control the next person. It's very difficult when folks are set in their ways. Um, and it, I think it speaks to the importance, like you were saying, um, the older generation to make space and make room to start to gain that understanding of the next generation. Um, but also there's room for private work, like in a kind of self-development. And then there's room for collective kind of um, exploration of who are we, and where are we going? And I think it's important to, to do the two. One of the other uh, chapters talked about the difference between legacy and sustainability, transforming mm -hmm. and transition. I thought that was a really interesting insight. Can we talk a little bit about that? What inspired you to come up with that framework? Mm. I, 
it's interesting it was through my experience just in the family enterprise and I just I guess we're in a very dynamic world right now with the you know technological disruption this industrial age that we're in and I feel like it's really important that families um, enterprising families are driving change not just reacting to change and it's important to drive innovation it's important to look for new opportunities it's important to always seek new um, methods whether it's investments or um, new joint ventures and I think this is strongly colored from my experience living and working in Nigeria which is a lot more dynamic environment than in the US but I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned from that in that because we face so much more political and economic volatility as a family we're constantly trying to drive change where's a new area of growth whether within the operating business or outside and I think it's important not just to focus on maintaining and stewarding what is but also looking at what's next and growing right so that's in my view the distinction between sustainability and really legacy so transforming there's an, a, a level of transforming as a family uh, beyond just stewarding um and that does require entrepreneurial skills it requires a skill set right for the family as owners and potentially as operators should they choose to operate their businesses to be able to drive this new opportunities from the owner's council or from the boardroom and it requires also an eye for um, relationships cultivating and building upon win-win partnerships again from the top and so yeah that's I'm very passionate about families really thinking about how can we transform and that's not to say to abandon everything we've known um, but just always keeping an eye on what's next absolutely and you and I had a pretty deep dive on that when I came on your show mm. so I want to again encourage the listeners we'll put the link in the show notes because we spent a good amount of time talking about some innovation processes that mature companies not just startups can can use just because we are a more mature business, we've been around maybe 5, 10, 15 years, 20 years, doesn't mean we can't innovate. Mm -hmm. And um, and there's some, uh, I think, again, I think you and I spent a lot of time talking about that. So I, I, I appreciated seeing that in your book. So again, just to underscore, you know, the, the way you see it is a difference of transformation versus transition. And one is perhaps more transactional, right? These things are happening day to day, the other is more strategic and, and the point mm. being, we need to you know, really come up with a, a strategy and plan around that. There's, this is not easy stuff, right? This is not, oh, we're going to take care of this in an afternoon. You're, mm. you're really advocating for a, commun a healthy communications process as business partners and being able to separate from the, call it the, the interpersonal side of, of the family when you're in the workplace to really think beyond right? Think beyond those day-to-day um, -day relationships so that you can, um, and I think just to kind of use your words, unlock innovation, creativity, intellectual diversity to bring about transformation. Mm -hmm. um, so the other question I have for you, Nikkei, is the next generation. One of the chapters talked about why next generations grapple with champion, championing change mm -hmm. and how we can support them. Is this a message to the senior leaders? Yeah, to the senior leaders as well as the next generation themselves for them to gain insight into the challenges that they're facing. I think a lot of the time it's, um, you know, the fit, the, the challenge of the shadow of wealth and the success of the founder does create psychological and like emotional challenges for the next generation in terms of their autonomy their mastery and their need to really um, gain, be able to see their impact in the family enterprise. A huge challenge also is that um, a lot of the time next geners have watched and seen their, the previous gen literally make, well, turn water into wine. And they've watched the previous gen make decisions very intuitively, right? Um, not necessarily, um, and, and really the genius is in their head and in their heart, and they don't know how their parents or their grandparents access this genius. They see decisions being made, 
but they don't understand the process through which decisions are made. And that can create a lot of kind of imposter syndrome and questioning of their competence and their leadership capability. And so there's a need for structured learning and structured mentoring. Oftentimes the founding generation are very entrepreneurial, they're visionaries, they're very intuitive, and they may not be the best people to provide that structured learning because they don't have it in them. <laughs> so there's a need for to bring someone else um, that is well-versed and trained in this, that understands family systems and also understands entrepreneurial leadership to guide them and coach them in those areas. I think also a huge issue is um, the next generation typically are yearning for the new they want to make an impact yesterday and just yesterday I was mentoring a few next gens and I was educating them on the difference between an evolution and a revolution right quite often as next generation we want a revolution we get it it's like make this laundry list of all the things that are wrong and we want to change everything dad mom this is wrong and what have you and quite often revolutions lead to disaster and may not actually bring about any change, just, just borders in the system. Um, whereas if we pursue an evolution, we're more likely to see greater impact. And that's back to what we were talking about earlier in terms of emotional proximity, understanding the lens through which everyone's seeing things, communicating in a way that they will hear through deep understanding of what matters to Lori, what are her top three concerns right now in the business? And how can I ensure that as I'm communicating my ideas, I'm actually addressing those and I'm able to capture her attention. And then we're, I'm not lecturing at her, I am educating her and giving her space for the two of us to co-create together what our future should be. So, yeah, I go deep in that, that chapter on the challenges that next gen face, why it is that they often struggle with championing change and also how they can go about and be more effective and impactful with that. Super important. Um, I think this is a great book for certainly generations who want to be more connected in their business, their family life. And as you said, also the folks who have been hired in from the outside to work with these leaders and I want to encourage everyone to to get the book how is it how can they find it Nikkei thank you they can find it on my website there's um nikkeianani.com forward slash book on there there's a trailer where you can learn more about the book there's sample chapters as well so a few chapters where you can read for free and there's also the link to the book on Amazon so it's available on Amazon for delivery worldwide um, so wherever you are you can place your order on Kindle or hard copy Wonderful. And I know you have many quotes in your book. And I love to ask again, if you have one that you would like to share. Yeah, I love Peter Stroppel. Legacy is leaving something in people, not just leaving something for people. I think quite often when we think about this space, we can think it's about leaving assets. And that would lead to why families would just drop a trust or a will or foundation and it's done. But it's not. It's about skill. It's about leaving, depositing a skill in the next generation and really about passing on this legacy of entrepreneurship, of collective wisdom, collective learnings, collective know-how, which stems from not only the triumphs of the family enterprise and the founder, but also the trials. So let's have those conversations on the good as well as the bad and trying to discover who we are collectively. Thanks so much for coming on the show, Nikkei. It was great to reunite with you here online and and uh, and catch up with you because it's been about a year, which is which is crazy that time flies. And again, congratulations on the launch of your book. Thank you so much for having me. And so to all the listeners, I hope if you're watching on YouTube, you've enjoyed watching us here. Please subscribe to the channel. And for those listening, uh, do subscribe wherever you listen to Succession Stories. And we look forward to catching up with you next time. Thanks so much.